I've known men for so long, since 1964. And see now, I've never jumped ship at all, ever cost. And you can read what I wrote in my own blog. I'm also a blogger. But I don't like to uh, talk so much about myself. But I think tonight's program, we are very fortunate to have Tengku. And he's given you a, a very, uh, uh, you know, rundown on what he did and all that. That was very, very impressive for a small startup company 15 years ago. And he has achieved it. Now, if Tengku can achieve it, I'm sure you plunge with your experience, your qualification into new business as advice. Go overseas. Forget about Malaysia. We have the talent core, right? We get back those Malaysians who are good and come back. But it is not working well in Bangkok. Uh, core. We all know. We pump in a lot of uh, money. But the return is uh, not very encouraging. But what Tempo is trying to say is move up from your comfort zone in Malaysia and see the other country uh, listed. Then you will know how to do business. And after five, seven years or ten years, you come back to Malaysia and help this country. Right? Don't play politics. If you are not a politician, don't play politics. But please, I'm not a politician. In and out. The question is here, I would like to pose to Tengku, apart from giving some encouragement to youngsters like you. Tengku, a very important question. I was interviewed by Business FM. If you know about Business FM, by Raslan. And I was interviewed about two weeks ago and when we initially came back last night, so after one week, and I switched on my, uh, my, uh, my computer and that was the radio program and uh, I could hear my own voice. Very interesting, business FM. It's under ideas. How many of you are familiar with ideas? What's an idea? It's a think tank, right? Think tank and uh, I think our Nagri Sumilan Tengku. Tengku Nerat? Not this man. But anyway, the question here, uh, Tinko, is that now with your experience and you've done so well, a lot of corporate leaders, you know, have been asking, and my son is one of them. And uh, the question here is, how much, in your opinion, do you think that the government should get involved in business, given the present political scenario? I'm comparing this to Singapore. Singapore, fantastic. They have so many GLC and GLC in Singapore, they are really, really doing that. They started government involvement when I was in Vietnam, the first posting in Vietnam. We have Singapore in Chaco. That is a platform for Singapore uh, government into the business in Singapore as well as overseas. They use in Chaco. So the question here is, how much, in your opinion, you think our present government, which is still the end, I hope so, after PR 13, it's still the end. Get involved in some business. That means the GLC, the whatever you have in mind. But tell, tell us and tell the audience how much should the government involve or should not involve in business, given the political situation. That's a very important question as we move on to PR 13. So give us your frank opinion. Right? Thinking of the Bolivar and Malay participation in our economy which is very small. Uh, thank you, Dato. Uh, I think now we should open the uh, other questions okay, to, I, I, to, to the uh, YCMS. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop from here. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Good evening, everyone. So three questions here. Yeah? Sorry, um, sorry. I have also three questions here. Yeah. Okay. Ah, I'm sure. Yes, you're right. Alright. The first question is, um, I'm actually in the middle of uh, what you call this career transition or whatever you call it, jobs. <laughs> right. I quit. I quit my uh, last job. It was uh, paying well and I was doing okay, but I was frustrated because I want to innovate in many ways. I want to do things differently. I want to add values in things I do. But employers or my superiors or whatever you call it, they usually don't want. They want to be in their comfort zone and do things the way they are because um, it works. And I mean, why spend more, more time in creating troubles? So my, my question here is that, as uh, we all know that you pose a very uh, important question that 
we need to innovate in order to compete and all. But how do we do this? As in, whenever I, I, I'm in the difficulty of finding a good employer to allow employees to innovate, um, that's also one, that one thing. That, that, that is one thing. And also, under a big environment, with this kind of uh, policies and uh, structure that we are in, we have a lot of, I mean, you can just put it this way, we can earn money easily by having connection and not having the need to innovate as a business. So, in a big, in a, in a, in a greater level, as a business, you don't need to innovate to earn money. So how do we do that? And in a smaller scale, as an employee and as a boss, I mean, a lot of bosses do business without having you know, innovate. I mean, if I cannot survive, I just use my money capital network, I do an like a business. So then, my like, first question. My second question would be, um, innovation usually come come from come a lot from a small company, SME, and all those those uh, not big big, big company. So, uh, can you can you tell us more about how you manage to uh, bring this startup to what it is now? As in, uh, what you need? Do you need a lot of connection? Do you need to be very knowledgeable? Do you need to have like the uh, People to get finance and what what, what you need to 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 you know, to get to start up and get it successful. So this is my second question. My third question is I uh, would like to know more about uh, your experience in traveling to other Asian country country like Indonesia and all. Because even though we are connected Facebook and all about our office, all the friends in our office were all around us. So we have to know more about both uh, supply and demand side as in. If you talk about people there are very hardworking, but how 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 fast do you think they can catch up with us? I said, are they smarter? Are they are they how how are they? Are they will they be like us once they get into middle income they will be comfortable and uh, what I mean then yeah, this is for the demand side. Sorry, for the supply side. For the demand side, how how is the customer there? How is the bosses there? How is the business? How is how different are they? Are they? So these are my three questions. So uh, let me just recap. My first question is on uh, uh, innovative innovation. How do you how do you manage to do innovation the big level as, in, as a business and as an individual? Second question is uh, what's my second question? <laughs> my second question was uh, oh yeah, my second question was on start. How do you do a successful start? My third question was uh, Asian Asian experience supply and demand side. So do you do you do you remember my question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna answer that uh, was with uh, answer first before I forget it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I, I've got your three questions. But about about government sector, I believe in government sector in stimulating the economy. Uh, I believe in in it developing industries like IT and so on. <laughs> Um, like for example, the training of uh, unemployed graduates, training and skills and so on, having HRDF funds to, to, to retrain uh, people, I believe in that. But there are certain times when the government does compete, even with us, and we feel that it's really unfair competition. So there will be a certain level where the government needs to reduce this, their involvement because it does crowd out a lot of things. I've lost some good people to GLCs, and I don't have any offense to any GLCs. Uh, and some of my good friends and my relatives are in GLCs. But they take the good people in. And it's hard for me to compete as an as a entrepreneur company, as a, start, as, as a private sector company, uh, non-GLC, to offer that kind of benefits to the staff. Uh, so it's very hard. So in terms of competition of uh, of manpower, these are the things where the government can, in fact, uh, diminish uh, competitive strengths of local companies. So they, they need to know when to step back. And some sectors is totally dependent on government. There is no private sector, uh, strong private companies that can be established inside that sector because of the presence of the government. And, and we have to restructure, relook at how we do business in the industry. Now, going back to your question, I'm sorry, what's your name? Chun. Chun, I'm uh, sorry. Okay, first question, um, innovation. Um, people mistake innovation as something grand, something rocket science. It's not. 
In innovation is something useful out of an invention. That's it. Useful. Useful means value. Now, we teach uh, entrepreneurship to 20, 200 apprentices in, in, in our company. We take 200 apprentices every year, and we teach entrepreneurship and leadership. And one of the case studies as the first week of our class is visiting uh, Om Burger. Anybody live in Ampang? Yeah? You know Om Burger in front of 7-Eleven? Now that guy has been around for 20, 30 years. Selling burglar. Now, if he's not innovative, he wouldn't be for 20, 30 years. Okay? One time, he was missing for two months. Up to a level when people were going crazy and upset because he's missing for two months. <laughs> because he couldn't get his burgers. Okay? It's delicious. It's not really healthy. It's really sloppy and well greasy. But it's delicious. Okay? And people were upset because he was missing two months. And he showed up and I said, Pachi, where, where were you for two months? I couldn't get my burger. Oh, sorry, they, uh, I, I went for Umrah with uh, my wife. Wow, oh, two months, stay in Umrah. It's, it's, uh, you were doing some business? And, no, Umrah, holiday, relax. He said, you must have learned a lot. Yeah, say makan, and he's always buying with him. And I was studying him. I always go back and ask, ask him questions. And I want to know, why how can this guy survive for so long? Right? And his, his and I ask him, what's his two innovation? He said, simple. Right? And then, you see, what time I open? He opened late at night. Huh? Yeah. I open around 10, 30, up to 4 o'clock. So that means I, I hit a different crowd. You see all those people open at around 2 o'clock and close at 5? How many burger stores are there? 5. You think I want to compete with them at 2 or 5? No. I go open at a different time now. Yeah. See that? And then he said, ah, in Nampang, a lot of masale. And this masale, like this yellow thing called mustard. And I put it in my stand because they like mustard. Obviously, I sit in front of 7-Eleven and mustard is only 4 ringgit, 24 cents. I buy mustard over there, put over here, and they sell more burger and what not. Because Ampang, that masala, that's all. That's all? Yeah, that's all. So you see how innovation can be as simple as it is? It's about putting value to your customer. For Scully, it was simple. It was taking open source technology, which licensing costs always cost 40 to 50 percent of the time. Take it out. Charge services on it, which is around the same price, and I get price competitive solutions that works, world class. Who doesn't want to pay 50% of the price and you get the same Mercedes or the same BMW? Same thing, simple as that. That's innovation, putting value, something to your customer. So take that, and it can be as simple as Omega. And that's what we teach entrepreneurship and leadership in Scali. You know, some of the things that are so simple and can sell a lot of things. Okay. Secondly, uh, how do we scale up? Well, you don't have, we have big, I think the same goes, uh, big plans uh, but small steps, and that's what we really did. We just said, look, you know, we want to grow 10 to 20% a year. So what's our target? What's our cost? How do we go into the market and work backwards? Uh, because I was an investment bank and the accounting principles always work backwards. What number you want, okay, we will do that. <laughs> so, but the investment, that's how it is, is, is taught. You work backwards. And that's how we look back and say, look, have the end in mind, look back. Don't think about big. Don't think about being as big as Facebook. Don't think about being as big as IBM. But think about putting the best value to your customer. For one customer, there will be five customers the next month. 50 customers to that, and soon you know you've got 5,000 customers. And that's what we did back better. We made to make sure that 38 ringgit that they pay us, to them it feels like it's 30,000 ringgit a month. Every time they call, we're there. Full force. Okay? When Indonesians were attacking uh, our Malaysian websites, many times, 
Okay? You know, we hired an extra security team just to look at Benegara's website, Kazana's website, EPS website. So we want to take care of that value. We don't care about cost. We want to make sure our customer is happy. Full stop. That's how you scale up. Don't think about money. Don't think about billions of dollars. Okay? Don't think about that. But think one customer at a time and focus on growing that 20%. We have five customers now. Focus on making eight customers happy next year. And so on and so on. Remember, good companies don't come about overnight. Okay? Uh, the likes of Google, Yahoo, whatever, Facebook, uh, is uh, one in a million. Okay? But the good companies that stand, you can see them still around, they are 100 years old. And they keep on growing and living. Okay? Now, the third question was Asian experience. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, one thing is that I think in terms of organization wise, in terms of the organization culture and structure, I think we're very much well advanced rather than, um, uh, rather than um, compared to these uh, organizations. But the export oriented organizations, like, the, like I said, the Vietnamese IT companies that are or very, because they're export oriented, they have to meet that standards, okay? So they're very versatile and very dynamic. But the mass of SMEs are still grappling. But you see, these countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, they got a massive domestic market. They can sell okay, their company and still make a lot of money. But we can't do that, right? And that's how our organizations and our SMEs have been quite versatile and strong. But the question is that I still get friends who go, why should I buy your software when I buy a Mercedes? I can put the money into a new Mercedes. Huh? They will say, ah, that's the option of the SME entrepreneur. Buy Mercedes, looks good. Or, you know, put your software, buy your software. Okay? Or get another salesperson. These, these are the options a lot of our SMEs are. And it's also the same, but in terms of organizational wise, I think. Yeah. But I think I just want to add about organizations being innovative and so on. We have this issue. It's really about competition. If we, if an organization is complacent, they won't be innovative. Survival will push everybody. But too much competition is also not good luck. I mean, you got airline industries where every ten years you have to build out airline. It's not just for Malaysia Airlines. Okay, the United Airlines in the US. Okay, British Airways, Qantas. All the time because competition is so much. But who makes the money? In the airline industry. Can you name? Any ideas? Boeing and Airbus. And a few of them, eh? Okay? So too much competition is not good, but competition at the right amount, okay, makes everybody innovative. For Scali, for IT industry like us, I have to fight with the IBM and the Microsoft. That keeps me awake every night, going asking everyone to say, how do I fight these guys? How, what, they've got like billions of R&D, okay, they have thousands of salespeople. How do I fight? So I have to fight on this region. Next question. Next question. Um, Assalamualaikum and good evening everyone. My name is Muhammad Sharif Majid, a student from University Technology Petronas. Now I'm doing an internship at an oil and gas company here in KL. Um, my question comes from my experience within my internship period. You see, I have met with a lot of chief mechanics, you know, in oil and gas, in order to get to that position, you must have value, you must have knowledge, you must have experience. And these chief mechanics are super people, they can just tell what's wrong with an engine by smelling at it, you know? <laughs> so, the problem is, all of these chief mechanics that I know are foreigners. They are no, not Malaysian people because you know, to get to that position, you need to undergo a lot of hardship, hard work, and I believe most of Malaysians, we are in our comfort zone, we don't want to go through all of those things, 
we just want to get a good pay and that's it. But it's different with these foreigners because they are in a do or die situation. So they have the will to fight till the end. And um, the thing that worries me the most is that the trend of companies, you know, we are actually nurturing, training and teaching these foreign talents. Yeah. So in a way, what we are doing is that we're doing what you said is the worst case scenario. We are facilitating and helping these countries to catch up with us a bit more faster. And, um, you know, my question is how can we move our very own people so that they become much more proactive like these people? Do we need to put them in a severe situation like, you know, those people that they are in their countries, it's very unstable, then only, you know, they have this, this fight in them. Just because we are stable, does this mean that our people have become much complacent? We don't want to work hard anymore. What do you think we should do to help, you know, motivate our people to rise up to that level? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Well, I have, I have five kids and I, as a father, I will ask myself, I mean, I don't want my kids to be complacent. I don't want my kids to be pampered. Um, one of the things is that I don't buy them expensive time, things I give them proper money and you're supposed to then buy it. Um, from speaking about my experience, my, my parents, because they don't want me to have a pampered life, they sent me to a boarding school at the age of 12. I think, I do not know, you recall when you were age of 12, you do, you do bingo, <laughs> right? I sent them all the way to the other end of the world, alone. Okay, I'm born in school and then I'm at, okay, as worse as Canada, minus 40 degrees. Okay, uh, but I think we need to teach our children that not to spin tea. And you know, I've seen how universities teach our students this memorization and spoon feeding. To be honest with you, they don't have the ability to find information themselves. And it's the journey to find information where they learn a lot. They learn how to use the internet, they go and talk to people and interview. But if you have to say, okay, this is the answer to the English memorize tomorrow, I will do the test. When are they going to learn? When are they going to learn how to speak to entrepreneurs, CEOs or managers if they don't go out and, and talk to people? And that's why we still have two students that are timid and coming out. So we need to change in how we teach and how we educate our next future generation. And that's, that's the start. We can't spoon feed people. In organizations like yourself, um, I've seen organizations that people don't perform and they still get two or three months bonus. I sit on a few boards of a few organizations and I said, I don't feel this company deserves, everybody deserves two, three months bonus. And if you do the 2080 rule, you should be rewarding two, three months bonus, or even eight, bon eight months bonus to only 20% of the staff. Why are you giving everybody? And that's rewarding complacency. If I don't do a good job, I just do my only job, I still get two or three months bonus. If I, if I do really good job, I don't get anything done. So you are rewarding the slackers, and you are this this uh, this intensifying uh, the the performance. Okay, so it's not helping out. Sometimes in our organization can scatter, and because we want to be very nice and very funny, we give this to a lot of people. And but that is pampering. And I'm wearing this pampering attitude makes us very weak because we don't stress our stuff. And you know what? We were like I said, we're only 29 million people. How are we going to compete with a life in Indonesia that went 250 million? Right? So we need to remember this. So this is the things that we need to have. Attitude and shaking this mentality of the spoon feeding, pampering people. Okay, next question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yamule Tengku, for sharing with us. Um, your prescription in becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, I have three comments. Uh, the first one is uh, with regards to the gentleman's query, whether you need something terrible to happen in order to be innovative. 
In fact, today we are having a conference called Science Technology Innovations at Royal Chelan, mm -hmm. uh, and it's organized by Academy of Science. And one of the key speakers had mentioned, in order to have to promote innovation, what you need is a man, a plan, and normally a crisis. Because when something terrible happens, then you put on the feet that you have to do something different. Yeah? So that's your uh, prescription. Uh, the two questions I'd like to refer is uh, Dato Mustafa Ong's uh, question to Yamule Tengu. What is, should business uh, get, uh, should government be involved too much in business? And your response was, not too much, otherwise you would affect the private sector. In fact, this was the same uh, response given by Tan Sri uh, Tony Fernandez during the World Economic, Islamic Economic Forum. He said, we want to do business, but government also wants to do business, but I think there should be a line where you do not compete with us. So maybe there could be a group of CEOs approaching the government that for the GLCs, we are not only looking at innovation in terms of technology, but they should have innovation in the business model because that is important. Because if you see the uh, report card of GLCs, some are emerging as winners, some need to be closed down, I think recently. So maybe that's one. Secondly, uh, with regards to uh, your comment that Malaysian should move up in order to gain the experience and exposure, as well as Dr. Mustafa's comment, talent cop is not really advancing as how it should. My uh, recommendation actually I've tried to push it so many times but it was with much difficulty and I think not much effect because from what I see is you know in Indonesia during Habibi's time when he was in uh, Germany he stayed on to look at all the business plans management and all that he came back to build the industry but our policy in Malaysia is if you set students out especially the government sponsored you need them to come back immediately after studies. But now I think they are giving a leeway of a year or two. I think they should relook that. And with regards to Talent Corp, I think it's a different business model they have to look at. Don't get the Malaysian who is so successful overseas to tie him back for a permanent job. That will not work. Because what we need to do is to look at how India did it. They have something called, uh, I think, NIC, non Indian. Um, citizen, where a lot of Indians went to Silicon Valley, become multi-millionaires, they happily stay there, but because of their loyalty to the country, they will come back only temporarily, short basis, to advise.